The night was cool, it was dark. It was a damp night. Dew in the air, already moistening the grass and the garments of two men who slipped down to the edge of the Jordan River. The Jordan River flowing cold, fast, dark. They waded the Jordan, came up on the other side, crossed the plain, and as the sun began to peep over the eastern sky, the fabled oasis of date palms came into view. And these two young men kept walking, nervously though, unfamiliar territory, it was obvious. And by mid-morning, with the sun at nine o'clock, the sun, they saw the sun gleaming off the ancient sandstone walls of Jericho. Jericho was already one of the oldest cities in the world. It had already been destroyed and rebuilt a number of times. These two men looked at Jericho. Then they looked at each other. They breathed hard. They swallowed hard. Swallowed a lump of fear and began moving toward the city as casually as possible. Moving as casually and inconspicuously as you can move when you're scared out of your pants. They were Hebrew spies. Spies with a mission. A mission given to them by two old men who had spied out this same country 38 years before. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, his associate. Joshua's orders to these two young spies were very simple, but not easy. The instructions were these. Walk into the city. Scope it out. Check the fortifications. Pay attention to the, the condition of the walls. Look for the weaponry. Notice what the provisions stored inside may be. And most of all, most of all, mix and mingle with the people in Jericho. See if you can get a feel for their morale, for their mood. See if they've got a fighting spirit or a timid spirit and report back. Report back to Joshua, the son of Nun. Jericho, and really all of Canaan at this time, was a land ripe for invasion. It was ripe for invasion because the people of Canaan lived in generation after generation of, of civil unrest. Can you imagine that in the Middle East? It was a world where a few people held the wealth and the power, but the masses lived in hand-to-mouth poverty, just existing, like, like Henry David Thoreau talked about back in the 1850s or so. He said, the majority of men lead lives of quiet desperation. They still do. They did then, especially in Canaan, especially in that old dirty city of Jericho because the masses 
who lived in Jericho, swarming its streets. The masses were under oppression. Their, their morale was very low and their resentment toward life and the powers that be was very high. High levels of frustration. And they, they almost longed for somebody, for somebody to change something, change anything. You know, when it's bad enough, and you get an opportunity for a change, it almost doesn't matter whether it's an improvement or not. Just any change is better than the same old, same old. They long for deliverance, and for some of them, deliverance was what they wanted, even if all it really meant was a different group of fresh, new oppressors. At least they could make a new start in this old city. In the middle of the city were two huge imposing structures that spoke without words, without language, who was really in charge in Jericho? Who, what held the power? There was the temple of Baal, the storm god, the powerful, frightening, lightning bolt storm god and his powerful priesthood who controlled religious life. And then there was the palace of the ruler, the one man who held thousands of men and women and boys and girls in his right hand. We're talking about thousands of people who lived and died in a rut. Sometimes we get into a rut because of some fault step, some bad decision we made. There are people who are born in a rut and don't ever get out of it. They used to say on the Oregon Trail, the wagon tracks, heavy laden, big iron, wooden wheels. They'd say this, you've heard this, choose your rut carefully, you'll be in it for a thousand miles. These men and women had been in their ruts for what seemed like a thousand miles and no end in sight, no, no way out. And people in a rut, people living lives of quiet desperation, People without much hope, people with sorrows and fears have always, always tended to spend a lot of time in saloons, bars, brothels, a place where for at least a couple of hours a man could drowned his sorrows and at least make his mind stop firing all the painful thoughts all through a clay jug of purple stuff and sometimes these men could for could for an evening forget about the day-to-day -day reality in the arms of a Young lady of the evening, we'll call her. People like that, men and women, flocked to those joints in Jericho. And uh, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word joint. Merle Haggard said it, it's not, it's not a reefer. He said, I remember when a joint was a bad place to be. You know what I'm talking about? This was a bad place to be. It was a joint, but it was a popular attraction. It was about the only popular place in town where you'd find music and dancing and people laughing. The joint was packed, which is why 
the two Israelite spies winding through the streets with hoods over their heads, concealing the strange cut of their beard that was peculiar to the Hebrew people and would have given them away. They saw the long lines and they themselves walked into the joint. Now these, these two Hebrew spies would have been fairly young men. Remember the children of Israel had been in the, wood, in the wilderness, the deserts, wandering around for almost 40 years. These were men who didn't even remember slavery. They didn't remember the parting of the Red Sea and plagues in Egypt. All they'd ever known was life in a barren, hostile wilderness. Now these were not mama's boys, oh no. They were kings of the wild frontier. They knew how to make it in a harsh, dangerous, barren land. Strong men, but still in some ways naive. And it must have shown on their faces, even as they walked through the doors. And I'm sure it had the kind of doors like in a Western movie where you go in, pop them open, and walk in. And I can just imagine they looked up. <coughs> looked up with the most peculiar look in their eye. And some old man said, what are you fellas looking at? And they said, what's this above our head? They'd never been under a roof before. Think about it. Never been in a roof, under a roof in their whole lives. And certainly never been in a joint. That was a bad place to be. But they did what Joshua said. They mixed and mingled. They stood and overheard conversations. They listened in on debates. They listened as people complained about the politics and how much they hoped the next change of power would actually change something in Jericho for a change. The men listened, they were taking this in. They paid attention to how many of the men wore swords. By the door, they noticed a long string of unstrung bows and quivers of arrows. It's kind of like you had to check your bow at the door, you know. They must have looked so out of place, but strangely, there was one other person in the joint who also looked out of place. It was a woman, a beautiful woman. According to Hebrew tradition, she was one of the four most beautiful women in the ancient world. She was the owner of the joint. Her name, Rahab, the harlot. A beautiful woman, probably nearing mid-age, which at that time would have been 30 when lifespans were short and life was cheap. She's a woman who had done pretty well for her financially. She, she had the most popular juke joint in town. It was the place to be, not just Saturday night, but every night, because what else was there to do in Jericho? This woman, this beautiful woman had a sad, sad look in her eyes that tears could not drown and makeup could not disguise. This was a woman living a life of affluence and yet still in quiet desperation. 
She was not a common harlot. She was more like Miss Kitty on Gunsmoke. She owned the place. She had other barmaids working for her. And she was good at what she did. One, in, in my first church, I was just young. I was, I was young and, 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 and I listened to old people talk a lot. And this one old man stopped me one day uh, after church. He said, Lance, I've got a piece of advice for you. If you can't be good, be good at it. <laughs> Rahab was good at it. She made a good living, this Kitty Russell did. But she didn't have a husband. Didn't have a husband. You can imagine why. It makes me think of the party at Twelve Oaks and Gone with the Wind. The party at Twelve Oaks, the barbecue that never should have ended. Scarlet with all her bows, begging to bring her dessert, standing around her and the other women sneering. And they said, oh, well, men may flirt with girls like that, but they don't marry them. A lot of men flirted with Rahab. Nobody had ever married her, though she already had a kid or two. And it's strange that these three people, two Canaanites who were totally out of place, and the owner of the joint also feeling terribly out of place, would have been drawn together in a conversation. Normally she didn't socialize with the customers any more than necessary, but she walked to these strange young men, strange looking, scared looking young men, and began a conversation. And as she walked up, as they saw her coming, they also noticed a man over in the corner with gleaming, red, angry eyes, staring them down. You know, it's like to be stared down and you hope they're not looking at you. And so you look away and you have a conversation, but as your eyes pass, they're still staring. This man was staring at the two Hebrew spies. But as Rahab approached, the man by the door rose abruptly and walked quickly out the door into the night. Where was he going? They didn't know. Just glad he's gone. They'd find out soon enough where he was going. But now, their attention was on the fourth most beautiful woman in all the world. She winked without saying a word, motion. Follow me to my room. Backstage left. With shaking hands. These two boys, this is the woman mama warned me about. But they followed her into her room. She slammed the door behind them, bolted it, and that's when the conversation started. And Rahab said to those boys, All right, cut the act. Who are you? And what are you doing here? As they searched for an answer, not finding one, she said, no, no, no. I think I already know. Let me tell you. You're spies, right? You're spies. You're Hebrew spies. We've heard of you people. We've heard legends. We wonder if they're true. We've heard what you did, what your God did to the Egyptians and our hearts quiver to think what you and your God might do to us. Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Excuse me, uh, verse 9, verse 9, verse 9. 
I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. Remember Joshua said, check out the morale of the people. Everyone's living in terror. But we've heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. We know that you, what you did to Sahan and Og, the two Amorite kings of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of heavens above heaven and earth. Isn't it interesting? That this Canaanite brothel innkeeper owner knew so much about the God of Israel. Maybe you can relate to her in one way. In many ways, spiritually, she knew of this God. And in her way, she believed in this strange, unseen God with no physical form. And yet she didn't know him. On one hand, she was afraid to meet him. On the other hand, she longed to meet him and to know him. We know. We know about you people. We've known this day would come. And then suddenly the conversation was interrupted by a crash in the main room and there was heavy footsteps and the sound of swords clanging against legs as men stormed into the big bar room shouting, shouting, shouting Rahab! Rahab! Come out! Come out! We know you're in there and we know we know two spies are with you. Quickly, she said to the men, opening the latch in her roof. Climb out onto my roof. They sped up the roof like young, scared men are capable of doing, skipping every other rung on the ladder. She found a stack of flags of hay and hid them under it, scampered back down the ladder, leaned back on her pallet, and she was smoking one of those those, those, uh, one of those long cigarettes, you know, that, that women in the 20s used to have. It, it's got a tube this long and there's a cigarette on the end. Looking in and speaking, it's like, okay. I'm saying she was trying to look normal. It didn't fool them though. They said, Rahab, we know two men came to you tonight. And we got a hunch who they are. Where are they? Where are they? She was silent. Speak, woman, or we'll cut your tongue out. <coughs> she spoke. She said, oh, 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 you mean those men? Those, those, those two boys who were here earlier. Well, they, they, you just missed them, as a matter of fact. They left about ten minutes ago. They headed out the city gates and into the hills. They said something about heading back toward Egypt. But now, if you'll, if you'll leave right now, you can overtake them. They're on foot. You can overtake them on horseback. They sneered. They turned and they, they ran out of the room. And then there was a thud of hoofbeats. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Boom, 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 boom. And it grew quiet again. And once the coast was clear, Rahab climbed back up on the roof. And the conversation continued. I know you're going to take this city, but do me a favor, she asked. Please, when you take this city, remember that I've been good to you. Remember me. Be good to me. Show mercy on me and show mercy on my family. Let's see that screen once again. She said to the men, swear to me by the Lord. Here again, she didn't yet know the Lord, but she knew that 
these people who follow the Lord are honest people. And if they swear by the Lord, they will do what they say they're going to do. Do you do what you say you're going to do? Swear to me by the Lord that you'll be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you'll let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their family. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agree. If you don't betray us, we'll keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope in the window. And once again, the two young men disappeared in the darkness, back across the plain of date palms, wading back through the cold, fast, deep, dark Jordan to the camp where they report to Joshua, the son of Nun. And Rahab was left alone knowing something that nobody else in town yet knew. Though on some deep unconscious level, they did know. They felt a storm brewing. Now what about the chance Rahab was taking? Collaborating. Collaborating with the enemy. Collaborating with the very people who are going to conquer her city. But remember, remember, our oppressors are not merely the people who live in faraway places and hate us from a distance. Some of the worst oppressors, oppressors, are those we live and work around all the time. And Rahab realized that by helping these, these two spies, she was giving up the only life she'd ever known. Now let that sink in. She'd never known anything else. She'd spent her whole life in this rut. It was a rich rut in her case, but a rut nonetheless. She knew how people looked at her on the street. She knew she had a reputation she'd never outlive. She knew what it was like to be a woman in a place where women were just objects. She knew oppression. So sometimes you and I will get the blessing from God and it's a blessing because God will arrange, God and circumstances conspire together to generate some sort of circumstance that destroys life as we know it. And our first thought is this is the worst thing that ever happened. I'm about to lose everything I've known and trusted but you know what? Sometimes that's a good thing. In fact, sometimes, maybe all the time, we have to get so sick, as they say in AA, so sick and tired of being sick and tired that we're willing to let go of the life we have because we realize it's taking us nowhere but down we release it and we open up to what's next. Rahab had no way of knowing it in that moment, but one of her distant descendants would one day make a statement I bet you've heard. One of Rahab's descendants was going to say, if you seek to preserve your life, you will lose it. But if you will lay it down for my sake, 
you will take life up again. There was another saying that Rahab's distant descendant said on more than one occasion. He used to say, you cannot serve two masters, for you will inevitably hate one and love the other. Rahab had a master. It wasn't so much a person, it was a way of life that had mastered her, that controlled her. And she'd grown to the point where she hated it. And she was ready for a new master. This new master, this new God she's heard about. Doesn't know much about him, but she knows it's got to be an improvement. And I'm open. Those kinds of thoughts flooded her mind as the day wore on. By noon, the posse was back. But the posse came back empty-handed and disappointed. Their horses lathered white with sweat, worn out the men with tired, worn, desperate looks on their faces. They had not found the two spies. Guess what they had found? They had topped the ridge and looked down onto a vast, Plain, where the camps of Israel lay, swarming like locusts in the valley below. And these Jericho posse men came back. They pulled themselves together and sounded the alarm. Close the gates, close the gates, bar them. Put someone on the wall above the gates. Heat up hot boiling order, oil that you can pour down because they're going to attack. Archers to the walls, archers to the walls. Bring in the flocks, bring in the herds. Haul water in, get ready for a siege. You know, I almost feel sorry some of the people in Jericho they were about to lose everything they had and it was a good life but it was all they had it was all they knew but meanwhile as Jericho braced themselves for the blow they knew was coming. Gloom settled in on the place. Oh, but it was a different scenario over in the camps of the Hebrews. The children were running, and the boys were playing war, trying to be like their daddies. The dogs were barking. The girls were running and screaming, not for fear, but for excitement. The men of war were strapping on their swords. They were polishing, sharpening their airheads and whatever makeshift armor they could find, where they could find it, they were strapping it on. And old Caleb, remember him? Caleb, he was now 85 years old. Forty years earlier, remember, Joshua and Caleb had spied out the land. Joshua and Caleb still alive in their 80s. Both of them mounted up and went to war that day. <laughs> I couldn't help but think of Caleb as a 78-year-old man going to war. It reminded me of my favorite childhood hero, Daniel Boone. You know, Daniel Boone lived to be 80, into his 80s. But when he was 78 years old, when Daniel Boone was 78 years old, he limped because he'd once been shot in a, in the, with a musket ball through his ankle at the siege of Boonesboro. 
And yet, as the War of 1812 broke up and the militia was signing up volunteers, 78-year-old Daniel Boone showed up and volunteered his services as an Army scout. And the young lieutenant said, thank you, Mr. Boone, but you've done your duty. You've done your duty. Caleb had done his duty, but the Bible says something supernatural about Caleb. Though he was 85, he had not aged the way an 85-year-old man normally aged. He even said, I'm as young, I'm as strong as I was the last time I went into Canaan. And my eyes are sharp, they're focused, they're clear. And so Caleb and Joshua led the forces across the, the Jordan, across the Date Palm Plain. And here's what transpired next, chapter six of Joshua. Joshua chapter six. I'll begin in verse one. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out, but the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horn, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and you will charge straight into the town. Joshua. With his banners dancing. Prancing on a horse as black as the night. Led his men around and around the city. The first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day. And on the seventh. Seven times around. And then came that trumpet blast. The chauffeur. In the ancient days, it was the war horn. It eventually became a celebration horn. This was both. The priests began to blow. battle around Jericho and it goes like this it says the lamb round sheep horns begin to blow the trumpets begin to sound all Israel shouted glory and the walls came tumbling down Jericho fell that day and as walls crumbled Grown men screamed and women wailed. Noise like the sound of a ripping tornado. Rahab in her upstairs window on the wall with her red cord hanging out. The red cord that identified her. The men had promised, we'll tell our leader Joshua Joshua will tell our men, do no harm to the family in the room with the red cord out the window. Oh, but inside that room with the red cord, there was fear, there was shaking, they were like children 
in a hurricane drill or an earthquake drill on the floor, their heads down, listening to pandemonium, destruction outside, and then slowly it all quieted down. No more screams, only a few whimpers. And then nothing. Nothing. Silence. Silence. The silence, death. A silence that was then broken by the heavy footsteps of men, their swords also clanging together, coming up the stairs, knocking on the door, pounding on the door. Rahab! Is this the home of Rahab the harlot? She was afraid to even speak. She held her head down as they kicked the door open and rushed in and she screamed, my God, my God. And then a familiar voice says, yes, ma'am, your God and our God are now the same God. She looked up and saw the two spies. And for the first time, she met Joshua, the son of Nun. And that was the day her whole life changed. Chapter 6, verse 23. They went in, they brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, all her other relatives. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. Verse 25, So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Lives, which indicates she was still alive and lived among the Israelites at the time this was first recorded. This Torah story was first told. But what happened to Rahab after that? Did she just go from one oppressor to another? She lost the storm god Baal. But she came to know the one who makes the cloud his chariot. The psalmist said. He maketh the cloud his chariot. He rides upon the wings of the wind. And she married a Hebrew man. You know what his name was? Salmon. Salmon. They had a child named Boaz. And Boaz, father of a son named Obed, who in turn fathered Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who was the father of David, the king. But most of all, Rahab, the harlot, was the direct ancestor of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The book of Hebrews chapter 11, called the Faith Hall of Fame, it lists men like Elijah, Moses, Abraham, and guess who else? Rahab, the harlot. What did Rahab do that we can do? Something that at various times in life, many of us have to do and do again. Here's what she did. She forsook her old oppressive Master, And I don't mean she literally had a master and she was not legally a slave, but her master was this destructive lifestyle that kept her down, cursing her and her family. She forsook the old oppressors and she found freedom. She took two big, simple, but very difficult steps to a total life makeover. 
I remind you what those steps were. First, she changed her allegiance. A new God. A new reason to live. A new spirit in her soul and in her bones. She changed her allegiance. And she also changed her association. Never again would she own a saloon, a brothel. May not have spent much more time under roofs, but she found a family. She forsook old associations and found new ones, and you can too. And when we talk about our associations, Forsaking the old, finding new. Uh, naturally, you think of, I think of, the people in our lives who pull us down for various reasons. Bad influence. They, every time we're around them, we wind up getting in the same kind of conversation that is just poison and toxic. They lead us. We go somewhere with them and always come home late at night with red eyes wishing we'd not gone. Yeah, there are people to forsake. People who are so toxic in their spirits that they'll infect you if you allow them to. Yeah, there's that. That's part of it. But you know what's more important even? It's the new associations you form. The new family you find. Healthy people. Joyful people. People who love themselves, they love you, they love the Lord, their God, and they'll accept you just as you are. I'm talking about people like many of those you're sitting around right now. And these new associations, I don't know if you knew this, these new associates, they get together every Wednesday night and Sunday morning in God's big living room. And there's a roof overhead, but it's tall. And there's plenty of room for all. There's room for you. Change your allegiance. Change your, change your associations. And you will change your life.